the starting point for this talk is the consensus in our profession and uh, backed up by esteemed bodies such as this that we should not be using press biopia correcting lenses in any eyes that are abnormal. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Now, of course, we know anecdotally that that envelope can be pushed. And as you can see, results have been published in the literature about using diffractive technology, for example, in patients with keratoconus with modest to good results. So we know that there is a, a, a margin to which we can push things. Um, next slide, if you would, please. Um, so this is the patient. This is the this is where the story really begins. Um, it is a... It is a 51-year-old, very active builder who presented with presbyopia and visually significant cortical cataracts. Now, the thing about builders in our country, Australia, and I don't know if it's the same where you're all from, but due to the, the vagaries of our economy, builders tend to be of a particular type. They tend to be very wealthy, they tend to be very smart, and they also tend to be very picky. And this gentleman presenting with this said he wanted to be spectacle independent, but when presented with the options of diffractive trifocality, very quickly said, I do not want that. I want to, no halos, no glare. I want to be free of glasses with no other problems. But then the challenge steepens when we see the steepening in his inferior cornea. We see the posterior elevation, um, uh, the enhanced specific sphere, the very low ambrosia relational thickness, and the very high Berlin ambrosio composite index. This, this gentleman has got mild keratoconus. At his age, it's unlikely to progress, but it's certainly at the level where it may be visually significant, which is something that has to be disclosed to him in the discussion about how we're actually going to achieve for him what he wishes. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, when surgeons talk about which lens is their fastball, uh, I think that is a, a bit of a misnomer because a fastball has a connotation that I'm just going to throw this lens into whomever and it doesn't require much thinking. I use the, 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 the Teleon family of lenses for most situations. It is my fastball, but I really rely on it in situations like this that do require a fair bit of thinking and a bit of nuance because the, the crispness of the optics is is it's unparalleled by any other lens that's available. So it's not only a fastball, but it's a lens that you can rely upon when things are really difficult. Uh, so I had a detailed discussion with him. I said, you know, this may not get you what you want, but I think this is the best way to do it. He was willing to proceed with an MF15, uh, the, the comfort in his dominant eye, and an MF30, the M plus in his non-dominant eye. If you go to the next slide, please. So this is uh, not, not that revealing. This is the, uh, the, uh, the comfort going into his first eye. Um, unlike Shri, I'm using a whole lot of viscoelastic because this is a very big lens and I can just take it all out afterwards. And I'm using the approved modification of the technique whereby the lens is flipped in the injector so that you don't need to rotate it 180 degrees once it goes into the eye. All very straightforward. If we go to the next slide. So here are his results um, and they're fantastic. Um, he, he's delighted with the outcome. Um, couldn't be happier despite the corneal abnormalities. But the thing is that for him, despite this very good outcome, at least initially, he experienced the early post-operative phase with an enormous amount of anxiety. And that translated into a lot of visits, a lot of coming into the office with every complaint. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, I don't actually see this as a nuisance. I see it as an opportunity to build rapport with a patient. Because in a situation like this, with lenses like these and outcomes like this, every time they come in with a complaint or a worry, you can reassure them. You can show them the outcome. And rather than being a point of contention or something that they're worried about, they leave each time with a stronger reassurance that they've had a fantastic outcome. So it's just an anecdote, uh, but I think it's a very powerful anecdote and it shows that with the right planning and the right tools at our disposal, we can achieve these excellent outcomes, even for patients who are otherwise marginal candidates. Thanks very much. We have a question for Michael. Such a perfect outcome. Yes, sir. The duration between the two surgeries. Uh, it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, the thing with the, the MF30 is that it's a custom lens, so it needs to be ordered. So it takes, in my country, six to eight weeks for it to arrange. So you need to plan the surgery well in advance, up to two months, uh, but then I would do the two surgeries about a fortnight apart, and that's what I did with this gentleman. So was the MF... he happy in between the surgeries? Was he happy? He had those, those visits, so I was reassuring him about the eye that we'd already operated on. Uh, he wasn't quite happy, but he could be reassured, yeah.
when you're looking at planning toric correction for astigmatism, you need to look at the topography to make sure that it's regular and there's no other features that are worrisome. The main ones that I'd focus on are if the patient exhibiting irregular astigmatism or if they have higher order aberrations, that's indicated by root mean square abnormalities in their whole eye wavefront and any of the topographic features that are leaning towards keratoconus. So a combination of those factors would definitely tend me to suggest that a patient does not have a diffractive eye well design. So with the M+, plus, what that means is the lens has to go in vertically. So the astigmatism component has to be put in, manufactured in at a custom angle. And of course, the other situation is if a patient lies at the extremes of refractive error, uh, and we had a very good example of that in the talks today, of when a custom lens had to be used simply because no other eye wall design would be available. It's remarkable because you can match it to the patient rather than trying to match the patient to a lens that's sitting on the shelf. Asymmetric refractive design plays an underutilized role in attaining the best visual outcomes for patients. Often patients and more so surgeons think that the only way to achieve spectacle independence is with diffractive IOL technology or with inducing monovision. Now they both have a role, but they both also have drawbacks which are widely documented. Whereas with asymmetric refractive designs, you can have the best of both worlds.